All right, everyone, welcome to the show. It's a parent's worst nightmare playing out on police body cam. A dad begging a police sergeant to help save his daughter who's unconscious and not breathing. That sergeant joins us to talk us through the terrifying ordeal coming up. But first, as I went into a restaurant yesterday, they asked me for proof of vaccination. I thought to myself, at this point, why? How does my vaccination protect any of the other diners? The data mounts showing that vaccines are ineffective at slowing the spread of COVID. In fact, the latest CDC guidance says it flat out. The COVID vaccine does not stop you from passing the virus on to others. Quote, CDC expects that anyone with Omicron infection can spread the virus to others, even if they're vaccinated or don't have symptoms. Yet as Omicron continues to tear through much of the country, many major metropolitan areas like Chicago, Boston, and Philadelphia are now, in the past few weeks, implementing a vaccine mandate. Joining places like New York, San Francisco, and New Orleans, which already had mandates in place. That doesn't make sense, but it also doesn't make me an anti-vaxxer. There are obviously still significant personal benefits to getting the COVID vaccine. It reduces the severity of symptoms, it prevents hospitalization, etc. I am vaxxed and boosted, but it is no longer clear that an unvaccinated person puts the people around them at any greater risk than someone who has taken the jab. The only reason I would support a vaccine mandate is if it protected others from the unvaccinated. But if someone wants to make dangerous decisions for themselves, then largely that should be up to them. Three, three bioethicists from Oxford made the case against the mandates in a recent op-ed in the academic news site, The Conversation. These experts were previously in favor of the mandate when it was more effective against transmission of previous strains. But with Omicron, they've reversed course, saying the reason mandates should be abandoned is because they're now pointless. To be justified, mandates must be effective in preventing transmission. They will only be necessary if there's no other way of preventing transmission to a similar degree. Yet there is now evidence to suggest that prior infection, so-called natural immunity, reduces the chance of infection and hence transmission to a large degree. That's the point. It's a big deal for a government or even private businesses to require people to take an injection. There had better be a really compelling reason. And I believe there was in the earlier days of the pandemic. But with Omicron, the evidence isn't there. Right now, I'm more concerned about sharing public space. I'm, you know, I'm not as any more concerned about sharing it with someone who's vaccinated or unvaccinated. And I think to maintain credibility on these very important issues, Local officials need to follow the facts. Joining me now is Dr. Amish Udalja. He is an infectious disease doctor, a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. Doctor, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Appreciate it. All right, so explain to me, do you think that Omicron has fundamentally changed the scientific reasoning for vaccine mandates? I do think that Omicron has really changed the game because this is a variant that possesses many mutations that allow it to get around some of the protection that vaccines and even booster vaccines provide. And this is going to really diminish the ability of the vaccine to be able to stop transmission in the way it could, even with the Delta variant. And I think we are at a point now where we're transitioning towards a a time when we treat COVID-19 like other respiratory infections. And many of these government issued mandates aren't necessarily going to, to fit anymore with these first generation vaccines and the explosive spread of Omicron that we've seen. So is it the top doctors who are, you know, sort of not staying on top of this? Meaning the CDC seems to be echoing what you just said. I read what they said. They seem to be saying that, you know, that when it comes to Omicron, the vaccines aren't going to prevent you from spreading it. Um, if that's the case, you would think that the nation's top doctors would be out there saying it's time to end the vaccine mandates, no? I think they're in a very difficult position because even though the vaccines are not as effective at stopping transmission as they have been in prior eras, the vaccines are still really good at stopping what matters, serious illness, hospitalization, and death. And there is 
still a, a huge swath of the population that are not vaccinated, that are impinging on hospital capacity. And I think they're trying to walk that fine line where if they say we're going to pull back on these, these mandates, then that might be open season for people not to get vaccinated and think it's not going to actually help against what we're trying to prevent, which is our hospitals going into crisis. And I think that's likely playing some role in the way they message. And, and public health messaging has been horrible throughout this pandemic. And I think this is another example of it. So, so it now becomes more like a seatbelt requirement, right? Which is, we, we've got a rule in place, uh, you got to abide by it, but really we're doing it to protect ourselves, right? It's not because someone else is going to get any more injured if I am, am or not, am not wearing a seatbelt. That's sort of what we're talking about now. For the most part, yes, it is something that gives you a, a great personal benefit to be vaccinated and everybody should be vaccinated and high risk people should be boosted because that prevents you from having any serious outcome with COVID-19. But the thing that's kind of muddles this is the fact that we all are kind of tied together in the same hospital system. So if there are a lot of unvaccinated individuals in your community, they're going to be something that uh, is not able to, you're going to be in a situation where you worry about the care, the capacity of your hospital to care for patients that have strokes, that have trauma. And that's the issue is that too many unvaccinated individuals in a community is kind of holding that hospital hostage. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. But, but just to be clear, um, you do agree that there's no evidence to suggest that being vaccinated helps you prevent transmitting the disease, correct? There, there is data, though, even though Omicron can get around some of the protection from vaccination, that it is able to decrease your overall chances of getting infected, even though it's not as much as it could with Delta. So there is decreased cases in people who are freshly vaccinated or freshly boosted. That's a transient benefit, and it'll eventually go down, but, but, and it's nowhere near the same level it was with prior variants or prior versions of this virus. All right, well, look, that's why we have you on, uh, is to inform us with the facts and the science uh, because I do think we need to, to stay on top of it week by week to figure out where are we and adjusting accordingly. Um, doctor, thanks so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Coming up with news of a grand jury being impaneled in Georgia to investigate former President Trump, the left-leaning media is in overdrive about how terrible and dangerous legally this is for Donald Trump. Many of them want you to believe charges are imminent. But my next guest has been knocking down that speculation since last summer. That's straight ahead. Stop me if you've heard this before. Prosecutors are investigating alleged criminal conduct by former President Donald Trump and an indictment could come at any time. You know, this week, Fulton County, Georgia's chief judge granted a request from the county's district attorney to impanel a special grand jury to aid in her investigation into possible interference in the 2020 presidential election by former President Donald Trump. Fulton County DA Fannie Willis had asked for the special grand jury last week, noting that her investigators had found reasonable probability the election was subject to possible criminal disruptions. Willis has previously said that her investigation includes a phone call between the former president and Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger from January 2nd of 2021. Some seemed confident now that Trump is in imminent legal jeopardy. I talked to a Trump advisor earlier this evening who said that this is very bad for him. There's, there's no question about it. Now, remember, the, the grand jury in Georgia is a civil grand jury, not a criminal one. And over the summer, many people, including me, thought that Trump could be close to being charged in Manhattan. Former federal prosecutor Mark Pomerantz had been hired to lead the investigation for the Manhattan DA's office earlier in the year. And then when the Trump Organization and its chief financial officer, Alan Weisselberg, were indicted on tax fraud charges, including grand larceny, I thought that they were likely closing in. But it hasn't happened. There is an intense demand, both in the media and among the anti-Trump portion of the American public to find a reason to send the 45th president to prison. But that desire to put Trump behind bars has so far led to nothing, time and again. You know, this past summer, there was an article in New York Magazine by former federal prosecutor Ankush Kardori. In the piece, 
Cardori laid out the numerous times former prosecutors turned media personalities ran with the story that a Trump prosecution was imminent despite evidence pointing to the contrary. And while predictions of Trump's imminent legal doom may be ratings gold for cable networks, they don't really tell us what's going on. So let's check in with Ann Kush Cardori, an attorney and contributing writer for New York Magazine, as well as a former federal prosecutor who specialized in financial fraud. All right, so Ann Kush, you, you really nailed this uh, back last summer. You can argue it's almost just gotten worse since then. Why do you think that so many of the analysts have been getting it wrong, both with regard to what happened in Manhattan and Georgia, and you could also argue on the federal level as well? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's been a convergence of, uh, of a bunch of uh, factors. I think the most important ones are, one, there is a, uh, a real bit of, I think, wishful thinking uh, going on amongst people who are not fans of Trump, uh, particularly lawyers. I include myself among that group, um, but I try to be sort of dis as dispassionate as I can possibly be. And the other is, quite honestly, you know, predicting Trump's imminent legal downfall has been a good way to get on television and to get Twitter followers, social media likes or whatever um, for five years now, almost, since the start of the Mueller investigation. And I think that a lot of these folks, however well-intentioned they may be in their own heads, I, I think that it is impossible to sort of dis fully disentangle those incentives. I'm not on social media, so I don't even really know. Uh, I, can't, I, I can only sp speculate uh, about how, how intense it is, but uh, I'm sure it's, it's distorting uh, a lot of the analysis out there. So, so my analysis of this, which you know, I, we don't know it's wrong, but it certainly was wrong that it was going to happen anytime imminently, was in the wake of the indictments of the Trump organization and as of, of his CFO and knowing who they had running the investigation in Manhattan. I had thought all of that, and not because I wanted it to happen, but I thought I was analyzing the situation in saying, OK, this all does look bad for Donald Trump, and yet you were saying at that time, hey, hey, everybody who's saying that, you're jumping to conclusions. What were we uh, getting wrong back then? Well, I was mean, I mean, still, as, as you know, there's, that investigation is technically still open. They've extended it by convening a, a new grand jury, special grand jury. So we don't yet know fully the outcome. Maybe you'll be vindicated at the end of the day, just more, more yeah. uh, later than you anticipated. I still remain skeptical. I think my baseline presumption as someone who conducted financial fraud investigations is that the odds that any investigation is going to go result in charges are not that high. And then when you layer on a particularly complex financial fraud, the odds go down further. Someone with particularly good legal resources down further. Talking about a former president, it should go down further because people should really be hesitant to uh, bring a case like that. And um, I think when you are dealing with a DA's office, whether that's Manhattan or Georgia, I, you know, I, I don't think they have as full or um, uh, potent legal tools as federal prosecutors do. So that's also informed my analysis somewhat too. For instance, in Georgia, I don't think they can do what potentially DOJ could do, which is get easy access to White House files. And I think that could be critical for any investigation that was uh, that's pursuing, say, you know, the, the call to Brad Raffensperger. So all of those things, I just you just kind of layer them on. And it's not to say that it's impossible that they will bring charges. Uh, it, it's possible. I think it's improbable. And I think drawing yeah. that distinction is really important. And, and the reason I'm doing this segment is because I think transparency and accountability are important. And it's important that if I say something where I said I thought that indications were that there could be an indictment and I'm wrong, I want to own it. And you know what else? You were one of the only ones at the time who was saying it exactly the way you did and you were right. And people don't like to follow up. They don't like to say I was wrong or you were right. Or, and I'm perfectly happy to, to, to call it the way, the way it goes and uh, let the chips fall where they may. And we'll continue to follow this. And Kush Kardori, we look forward to having you back. Thanks again. Coming up, politics is a blood sport. As one reporter found out the hard way during an exchange with White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki. That's next.
Time now for our media moments where we check in on the day's bias, buzz, and bull in the world of cable news and beyond. Tonight, we turn to the White House briefing room, where the back and forth between press secretary Jen Psaki and reporters can be a kill or be killed type sport. Sometimes the media gets the best of Psaki with pointed questions that back her into a rhetorical corner. And yet, other times, she's the one asking the tough questions right back, as was evidenced by this painful moment featuring Christian Broadcasting Network correspondent. Caitlin Burke. Can you speak to concerns that spending plans that come out of Build Back Better aren't paid for and so could mean higher deficits and more inflation in the future? Aren't paid for? Correct. Build Back Better is paid for. It's a fair question, but if you noticed a brief but awkward pause following that exchange, you're not alone. Unfortunately for Burke, it went downhill from there. Okay. Can you speak to the concerns that are coming in that it's, it's not Who are not the concerns actually... from, though? But who's saying it's not paid for? Because there have been a range of economists saying it's entirely paid for. Um, and that has been a priority for the president. We did not edit in that awkward pause. That happened in real time. Saki clearly knew she had a wounded prey in her sights and went in for the kill. It has also been concluded by a number of Nobel laureates and experts from uh, a range of economic experts on the outside that it will not contribute to inflation. So those are the global experts that we would point to, but there may be others suggesting something else, but I don't know who those people are. So this is the point where if you've studied the issue, you follow up with a tough question, challenging Saki. But if you haven't, well, then you just take the L, right? And live to fight another day. Unfortunately for Burke, she didn't either. So they're also not expected to contribute to future inflation then? The Build Back Better bill? Again, it's fully paid for. We would point to Nobel laureates and a range of global economists who have conveyed that it would not contribute to inflationary pressures. I'll admit, I root for the media in these exchanges with Jen Psaki. So this was a tough one to watch. Uh, for Caitlin Burke. She gets credit, though, for her post-game analysis of the moment on the Daily Rundown podcast. I'm not going to lie. I was a little mortified. <laughs> it, was, it was my first White House briefing question. <laughs> and, I, you know, I will admit I wasn't prepared enough. Politics and media can be a rough game for rookies. That's our wrap-up of the day's Media Bias Buzz and the Bull. Coming up, if a man was seen on video allegedly assaulting a female TikTok star who was incapacitated, me mainstream media would be all over it, right? But you may not have heard about this allegation from young TikTok star Jack Wright against a fellow female influencer, maybe because the alleged victim is a man. That's next. That was a really satisfying takedown. When I explain to you what happened, you'll understand. It was all orchestrated by a grandma after a scam artist tried to con her out of thousands of dollars. Jean Everett got a call from a guy who said he was her grandson. He was in jail for a DUI and needed bail money to get out. Now, Everett, who doesn't have a grandson old enough to drive, at first thought it was a joke, then realized it was a scam. So she played along, eventually convinced the guy to show up at her house so she could pay him eight grand, which was actually paper towel stuffed into a manila envelope. Then she called the cops and set up her own sting operation. Now, here's the guy walking up nonchalantly to the door. He shows her the invoice number, eventually, double checks her name, then takes the fake cash and starts walking away. Seems nothing is amiss until this. Go to the ground. Go to the ground. Give me your hand. Give me your hand. Give me your hand. Yeah, I'm here. Jean even walks over to question the suspect herself while police put cuffs on him. 
28-year-old Joshua Estrella Gomez is now charged with attempted grand larceny. Good work by the Nassau County Police as well, who gave Gene the assist. It goes without saying, but obviously don't do this at home. Obviously, this was a win for Gene. She caught the bad guys, of course, with the help of some good police work. But if you get a call like that from the scammer, work with the police on it, just like Gene did. We're thrilled to have Grandma Jean joining us now from her home in Long Island. Jean, thank you very much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. All right, this is a little bit confusing to me. It wasn't just one phone call that the guy makes. It's sort of a more of a complex scam. Yes, the first call was the person pretending to be my grandson. Then I talked to somebody in municipal court. Then I talked to a lawyer who was representing my grandson who asked me for the bail money. And then the very last person uh, that I heard from was when they came to my door and pretended to be the bail bondsman. So they all had different roles in the scam. And were there different voices on the phone? I mean, like, was there a different scammer playing the lawyer? Or you think that they were just the same person was, was putting on different voices in the end? You know, I don't really know. The voice of the grandson crying and saying he was in jail definitely sounded young. The other voices sounded older. So it could have been two people. I'm not really sure. And so how old is your oldest grandson? Uh, 13. All right. So did you at any point think it's possible that my 13-year-old grandson somehow got into a car and then got pulled over for DUI? Never. <laughs> never. Right. So that was never an option. So, so at this point, you know that someone's sort of trying to scam you. Do you have any idea why they targeted you? I have no idea. I've had this call before. I've hung up on them, and uh, I, don't, I just happened to stay on the phone today, that day, Thursday. So, so t take, take me through for a moment how you bring in the police into this and getting him to your house. What happened was I was texting with my son in the morning when the house phone rang and the guy starts with this crying, saying he's in jail. So I text to my son, oh, I have a scammer on the line, and my son texts back, hang up, ma. And when he told me to hang up, I was like, not. I didn't hang up. Usually I hang up. So I stayed on the line with them. He gave me number. He gave me a phone number and a case number, and he gave me some information. I wrote it down. I'm, I was doing the crossword puzzle. I wrote it down on my crossword puzzle page. I called the number. Nobody answered and hung up. And I told my son, ah, this is over with. Nobody answered. Well, five minutes later, the person in the court called me back. He asked me for my grandson's name, so I had to make one up. And I did. I took the first name of one of my son-in-laws and the last name of my other son-in-law, and I made a new name. And uh, he said, uh, okay, you know, we have him here and, you know, we're going to have to try and get him a lawyer. So then a lawyer named Matt Levine eventually calls me. He's the one who eventually asks me for $8,000. And I tell him that I'm just so happened to be getting my kitchen redone and I have cash in the house because the contractor wants cash. And uh, he believes me. <laughs> He actually yeah. tells me my contractor, he actually told me my contractor is trying to avoid paying taxes. That's why he's asking for cash. I'm like, isn't this the <laughs> pot calling the kettle black? So, right. So, so Matt Levine, the, the fake lawyer, is now giving you legal advice as well. Um, right, on what, about uh, my uh, contractor. <laughs> so, um, all right, so, so then he, ahead, he yeah. eventually tells me, when I tell him I have cash in the house, I kind of think it started to go fast. Meanwhile, my son is texting my daughter, who works at 911, and I'm retired from 911, and he's telling her, do you know what your mother is doing? So then I get a call <laughs> from the daughter who says, Ma, call the police, because he knows where you live, he knows how old you are, and, you know, they Google your phone number. They know everything about you. So he knows how, wait, wait, how wait. old you are. He knows wait. where you live. You need to call the police and at least make a police report. So that's what I did. Wait, I called wait, wait. directly over to the precinct. Before you called the police, so, you, were you were planning on, on having the scammer come over anyway and, and scamming him? No. Or, I, or you only I, did it? Oh, okay, okay. I wanted to make sure that you weren't going to do had, this on I, your own. I thought... <laughs> I, 
one point I thought, um, you know, okay, maybe this is, uh, you know, I thought I was just going to say F you and hang up on him eventually. And it didn't happen that way because he, you know, he, he was telling me that, he, you know, they were going to come and get the money. He had a bail bondsman. He made, he gave me a whole bunch of numbers, a whole bunch of uh, instructions to follow about the envelope and everything. By then I had the cops here. It started a little before 12 and the, okay. the cops got here at 1 and at uh, bef- 2 o'clock he was under arrest. So it went fast from then. Even the uh, officers that were here didn't think it would go that fast because their cars were in front of my house. And uh, I have the, the ba- bail bondsman on the phone telling me he's, he'll be here in less than 10 minutes. And the officer had to run their cars down to the firehouse. Huh. Well, you know, Gene, we're, we're, I'm sort of laughing a little bit about this because it's, it's a little bit absurd. But you know what? You saved someone else, I'm certain from getting scammed uh, by doing this. There is no doubt that you saved someone else from getting ripped off. Um, So, you know, you deserve a lot of credit for that. Thank you. Well, that's the whole point is the publicity that the next person that gets this call will think twice before they go taking money out of the bank and giving it away. Yep. Gene Ebert, thank you so much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Great to have you. Thank you. Coming up, a desperate dad rushes up to an officer with his unconscious child in his arms. It is a parent's worst nightmare. Well, here's the hero sergeant who jumped into action to save that little girl. It's going to take us through those terrifying moments up next. Tonight, instead of showing you the dangers police officers face in the line of duty, we show you an act of heroism. We're on scene with an LAPD sergeant helping one of the youngest members of the community who was not breathing. The sergeant will join me in a moment. It's every parent's worst nightmare. A father whose daughter was unconscious stopped Sergeant Bum Jin Kim as he was driving down the street. Father was pleading for help. And he knew that every second counted. Oh God. Sergeant Kim took the girl, called for an ambulance, he put the child over his knee. He hit her on the back. Something had stuck in the girl's throat and it fell out. And she started breathing and crying again. Firefighters arrived and rushed the girl to Children's Hospital in stable condition. Ooh, I got tears in my eyes on that one. I'm happy to be joined by LAPD Sergeant uh, Bum Jin Kim. Sergeant, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Uh, take us through this. How did the parents get your attention to start? Well, I was stopped at a stoplight when a um uh, a convertible containing an adult started yelling at me. I, I don't know what he was saying at the time. Um, but all of a sudden, the vehicle stopped in front of my black and white. And he jumped out with a, uh, a young baby in his arms, uh, lifeless, pale, and just not moving. And then what happens next? And then um, he has off, hands off the baby to me and says, help me, help me. And, you know, as a father myself, I was uh, affected there on the spot. But my biggest thing was, let's get the baby breathing. Let's get off the street. Let's get paramedics rolling. And did you, was it clear to you? I mean, look, you know, I'm sure you've had, or you may have had some basic, uh, you know, EMS training, but that's not what you do for a living. Did, was it clear to you from the beginning that she had something stuck in her in her throat no it was not clear to me but due to the lighting and things like that and due to the urgency um and the fact that i have a three-year-old myself um my first thought was she may be choking on something it was just a big guess that i had um so i started administering first aid using the finger sweep and back thrust trying to get her to loosen any obstruction that she may have and is that something that you were trained to do as a police officer, or is that something that uh, you would learn to do elsewhere? 
But this is some this is training that we get from LAPD, and it's uh, it's updated every I believe couple of years. Um, and thankfully, this time it really came in handy for me and the family. I asked you that. Yeah, I asked you that question intentionally because I think it's really important for people to know that that's another side of policing uh, that people don't know about sometimes is the training that you go through that doesn't relate to dealing with suspects, et cetera. It deals with helping uh, people and training uh, to try to help in a situation like this. And clearly your training uh, was instrumental here. Let me, you took the child, you gave her first aid. I wanna watch that moment one more time. She was in the car with me. I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, mommy. It's okay. Mommy. It's please, okay, please, my love. Please, what does she have? Please. What does she have, mommy? Uh, open up. Uh. Yeah, something came out. Something came out. Tell me this, you know, your dad, what was the sense of relief like when you heard the girl crying? Well, as soon as she started crying, it was, hey, we have a chance. You know, we have a chance. Um, not just me, but us as a community, uh, as a mother and father sitting there, I, we have a chance. So um, from there, I just wanted the paramedics to get there to administer more first aid or whatever services they, they could provide. Have you gotten a chance to meet with the family? I have not. I would love to. Um, she's such a sweet, beautiful girl. I haven't had a chance to meet her. Um, it was pretty traumatic for, I think, all of us at scene. And it was just a, such a relief to see her um, get in the ambulance crying and breathing. Well, I know what they would be saying to you uh, if they were here and when you meet them. And I will speak for all citizens watching this. Thank you, Sergeant Bum Jin Kim. We appreciate you coming on the show. We appreciate what you did. It's important stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And remember, we want to hear from you. Try and zoom in live. We're going to do that again. Have you guys come on. Tell me what I'm getting right, what I'm getting wrong. Newsnationnow.com slash DAL. Let's discuss. Come join me on the show. That does it for this edition. News Nation Prime with Marnie Hughes starts right now. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.